Goedemorgen, good morning. This is Fintech Cappuccino, the Saturday morning podcast about the why and purpose of all things Fintech. The show is jointly hosted by Brian van Wachem, CEO of RedSnap, and my name is Connie Dorstein. I'm the co-founder of Bankify. Welcome. Hi, Connie. I know you're terribly busy with Money 2020, but uh, I thought about our podcast. Can we do for once something different? Can we just, I mean, all the people who matter in the banking and the financial service sector in the fintech world are there. I know, I know, I know, I know, Brian. And I've got a cool idea. I just saw Matthias walk past in his new cool shirt with MK on it. So I think I'm going to run after him tackle. and grab him and tackle him and see that we can get him in front of the, of the, of the uh, not the camera. No, let's just keep the mic. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Get him. Okay, get him. I'm going to go yeah? and get him. Right. Promise. I feel the heat. Today's guest is Matthias Kroener, the founder of Fidor. He is on a mission to democratize financial services in co-creation with customers and partners. And he truly is viewed as one of Europe's most visionary entrepreneurs and one of the banking industry's most progressive and, may I say, energetic leaders. Recently, Matthias decided to step down as CEO from Fidor and he is moving into Pastures Green. We'll hear more about it very soon. All right, welcome, uh, Matthias, in uh, our podcast. Um, this sounds slightly different. So where does this sound come from? So Defected is is um, a... Yeah, it's a, it's a movement out of house music, so to say, and, and this kind of house music and in particular this kind of rhythm and, and the bass line to this and all that uh, reminds me to some very great days on Ibiza and I, I have a very positive memory on this and sadly haven't been on the island, as they say, on the White Island for quite a while. So I have to go there and it's that's vocation. Oh, we'll come back to this, what you're going to do with your future time. Yeah. But, um, so, so what do you normally do on a Saturday morning? Well, given the fact that uh, I'm, I'm father of uh, kids and we are a family uh, together with my wife, of course, um, there's a lot of stuff going on on Saturday mornings. It's, first of all, it's having a nap not getting up at 6 a.m. whatsoever, like during the week. So this is something very much relaxing. Uh, but given the fact, of course, that Saturdays are the, the days where you can do your shopping yep. and uh, all your kind of, I would say, family maintenance stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And uh, then our son has a very tight program. He's a, a player in a, in, a, in a football team. So that means that we, the parents, are the logistics to this and so on and so forth. And and, and we are the logistics, we are the supporters, we are all kinds of roles you have to do there. Uh, and this is covering more or less yeah. the su- Saturday until so, so, the so afternoon. I get it. So this is why you retired. Your next sort of aim is on the son becoming the star soccer player. And he's totally. going to provide for the family. Absolutely. <laughs> ah. Absolutely. Somebody has to make the money in this so, family. So, M- Matthias, yeah? uh, when we've known each other for quite a while. And I must say, every time I see you, but even when I just hear you or think of you, I, one word pops up immediately and it's energy. And it has something to do with your physique and your eyes, but also very much with your mentality what i'm keen to learn is what gives you energy and what drains your energy yeah i so first of all thank you so much for that and i believe me visit me on a saturday morning and you will me you will definitely see me less energetic (laughs) 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 um so what what gives me energy is what what makes me what kind of keeps me going and keeps me motivated is and i have to knock on wood actually it's not getting less so far is um, that I realize that we are living in a, in a world which is full of options, right? Uh, and I mean this, of course, negative options, no doubt about it, but I, I would say we're living in a world of very positive options. We have a lot of opportunities, uh, I think more than ever. And I might say that because I'm in a certain age now already, you know, being more than a bit older than 50 is is not young anymore. So I can look back to a certain experience. That was not always the case, you know. So I would say if I look back to my 25 years of plus uh, of, of professional development there, 
I never experienced, for instance, a, a period in which you had so many opportunities if you are kind of willing to work on it, uh, if you're disciplined to work on it, if you, you can get the funding for this, you, you have the freedom to set up something, to create something, um, you can kind of think about what is your contribution to make that a better place and so on and so forth. And this is something I find to be extremely motivating. And if I look back and, and think about maybe having A level now or IB now, um, I would be like a little, or I am sometimes like a little kid in the toy store, finding it really hard to say, wow, this is all so fantastic. Let me do all of it, you know? Um, and, and, and that, that I, 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 you can make the difference, yeah. you know, you can deliver an impact and, And having this opportunity, I'm, I'm so extremely thankful for this. Yeah. And this is what keeps me going. Yeah, but to a degree as well, I know what you're saying because I feel very much the same, but you also make it yourself, but you're thankful for the DNA that makes you uh, like that. So on the other hand, what is sort of what takes your energy? And I, I'm not a complainer, but I have learned to watch out for the energy drainers yeah. because some people and some attitudes, some behaviors have a, mesh, have a fantastic skill of drawing you in and only later you realize it costs you a lot of energy and for me for instance it's people who um, make their problem mine yeah. eh? or yeah. and, and eh? because they're a victim so they basically take their shit and put yeah. it on my plate that really drains energy because before i know it i start solving that problem so what takes your energy well yes of course and, and there, are, there are many ways of of um let me say, wasting my energy. And uh, of course, um, outsourcing your problems to, to me or to anybody else uh, is, is one way of doing it. And, and then as you also, I, I think there are a lot of very famous proverbs that, you know, stay away from people who have a problem for all your solutions or something like that. Um, this is, this is uh, at a certain level also, let me say, not making it really easy. Um, however, I would say uh, at a certain degree, this is is part of your norm, normal in particular once you're in a day-to-day -day operation this is part of your job description and and as I was the CEO of, of two banks now for I would say in combination something like 20 years believe me getting as you just said it shit on the table was definitely my core job description yeah. you know yeah. mm -hmm. and <laughs> so so and and I also always said like um, you know whenever uh, actually there is uh, accumulated the view of the team about all the other team members I, I should fire the whole team actually accumulatedly so I think I think there you can create a kind of self-protection mechanism in order to just wash that away and say listen this is normal day-to-day -day yeah. kind of problem statements uh, which are being human somewhat like you know a lot of people find it easier to complain than to be Yeah, joyful about it's something. It's a very good point you're making because I found that as I get older, I'm the same age as you, more or less. Um, you get you better. You look much younger. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> this is the Mutual I'm Appreciation so Society. The Mutual Appreciation Society. Uh, but I think I also got better at sometimes just letting go, not solving everything, but just letting go. I have a good glass of red wine and start the next day all over again. Hey, but um, I want to dive a little bit deeper on uh, on the motivation. So uh, also for the listeners. So you so basically you started in 1993 with the uh, direct Anlagebank, right? Uh, the first discount broker in Europe, basically, which was later acquired by BNP. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about the motivation, why you started that? Total, there was no dedicated motivation, actually. There was more like being to be very honest, around by accident. Okay. So this is really like... Serendipity you know, almost. Yeah, that there was, uh, there's a bomb exploding, you, you stand next door, so in a positive meaning, you know. <laughs> so this is hopefully, <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't have a chat now. So um, silly picture maybe. But um, no, it, it, it was, uh, let me say my those days, boss Gerhard Huber, whom I have to give the credits for that. Yeah. Um, and, and he was, I, I was doing, let me start it like this. So I'm coming from hospitality business. I started my business life in a hotel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a dedicated, I would say, service guy. There is no family background that I did it. It was just pure curiosity. I, I did my military service. I didn't want to study in the university. I had the strong feeling I need to do something with my 
hands and I must see instant outcome of my work and I want to work in a team and that, that all shall be exciting and international. Okay. <laughs> Summary, hotel. Okay, okay. but le let's move then. Let's move then to something which is not an accident and that is uh, 2007 starting on Fedor. Yeah, starting but all Fedor. this comes together because... Um, I was then, before I came to the bank, I was studying also at least a very short time in, in, uh, in the US, in Cornell, which is very well known for its hotel administration and management university. And those guys told me, actually, if you want to know, if you want to work 12 hours instead of 14, you have to know how your enemy is working and your enemy is your working capital granting bank. Because ah, by the interest rate. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. and, and this is, I remembered that for, it, it was an easy formula, you know, I need easy formulas. So this was an easy formula. And, and when I was done with my studies, I applied at a bank and said, listen, I want to do an intern, not telling them that they are the enemy. Okay. And, and I had the opportunity <laughs> to be in, in a small <laughs> private bank in Munich and they opened up uh, very generously kind of the whole organization for me so that in this six months, I had the opportunity to visit all kinds of departments of that small bank. And in parallel, applied for uh, assistant to the management of a hotel group, whatever. So the hotel I started working in was a Kempinski. Uh, so tried to get there back there. And by those days, boss mentioned Gerhard Huber came up to me and said, listen, so what are you doing now? And I said, yeah, I'm going to go back to hotel. He said, why don't you stay in a bank? And I said something like, look at you, look at me. There's a difference. Uh, <laughs> What's there? <laughs> no, in particular with him, not that much. You know, with the others, yes. And, and otherwise that wouldn't have worked out. But, you know, like, like uh, you know, very traditional bank. And, and he was definitely different. And, um, and he said, why don't you stay? You're actually not that stupid. It literally said it. Uh, at least I remember it like this. You're not that stupid, so why don't you stay around? And, and you could do kind of learn a lot of stuff here. And, and I said, yeah, but I'm a, a dedicated hotelier and you're a banker, you know, so that's something different. He said, yeah, but your only risk is, and that was his tagline, I never will forget because he caught me on that. Your only risk is to be double qualified after you're finished with this management trainee program, which I offer you, by the way, and it's the first management trainee program in the 170 years history of this bank i said okay wow now we're talking <laughs> um and we started that we started that and one day he came up to me and said hey matthias look at this this is charles schwab we have to create something like charles schwab in germany and i said i don't know charles schwab i know ritz carlton <laughs> but <laughs> i know charles schwab <laughs> yeah oh, now well, i know yes. charles schwab as well and yeah. he's around in the finta he's around here also yeah. on the money 2020 which i find to be extremely exciting and okay but that was not that hard to get actually what it is and i said okay so let's sit let's sit down and that was more or less like spring 93 and and we traveled to boston Talking about Charles Schwab, we've visited financial uh, Fidelity Brokerage Services in Boston. And as today, I remember it, it was August 1993 when we sat down in the Copley Square Plaza Hotel with those days a 15 kilogram laptop and uh, did actually... A did schlepptop. A schlepptop. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we had to pay extra luggage for that. Uh, and, and did the first blueprint of what we called those days the new bank. So that is how it happened. Ah, and okay. So what, what, was, okay. what, what made the difference? I would say I was absolutely willing for curiosity to jump into this. I was never, never one single second kind of questioning whether that makes sense or not or, okay, okay. or could be dangerous or whatsoever. No, I found it extremely exciting. So, so jumping now to um, 10 years ahead in 2007, mm. because that will be probably a slightly different story, right? So you, you started Fedor probably Fido. intentionally. Yeah, and of not, course. Not, without, <laughs> not with the bomb story. Yeah, right? no, 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 no. And, and yeah, of course, that was uh, definitely on intention. And, and as said in, in DAB Bank, I was in the beginning, I was uh, a management trainee. So, and, and that made me, by the way, available because I was not kind of stuck into day to day work. Um, and I was not, by the way, too much incumbent already. 
right? So I was open for the new stuff, actually, and I was not kind of finding trying to find a lot of problems for your solution you know so this <laughs> okay. is uh this is definitely something which was making it happen no and and 27 actually you know with that dab bank experience in in the back of our minds uh in the back of my mind i did know that you can set up own banks you know you can actually set up and found an own new bank like like you can set up any kind of a company yeah. and why shouldn't you and this is yeah. by the way one of the topics i'm frequently following up on once we talk about corporate cultures why don't we have more kind of entrepreneurship in banking you know like 150 200 years ago when famous well-known brands have been yeah. established and founded those guys took the full risk you know i think they went bankrupt See over three generations, yeah. build it up again. This was when this kind of phrase of banquier actually personally fully liable was all around not to all be those compared banks were based on families exactly not risky. to be compared of what we yeah. today have as a manager no. and your only risk is maybe losing your bonus mm -hmm. and maybe the bank still needs to pay your bonus despite yeah. no, the, the fact that you the that you bonus. blown this the it up this difference between the egg and the bacon yeah exactly they exactly were the bacon. Absolutely. they've been fully bacon yeah? yeah and 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 this is something And this is something what we wanted to follow up and have in mind 2007, then when we had the banking license application, actually literally weeks later, uh, the banking crisis started. And in 2008, when we finally set up and opened uh, the first community to feeder, Uh, because community to me in a bank is a digital community in a bank is always an essential and almost hard to separate combination. Um, that community discussed with us how banks shall be better in future and what we do not want to see again from a bank and what we need to see from a bank. I'm going I'm to jump that in there because yes, that's please. a very important point you're making. In fact, um, we're here at, at Money 2020, as we said earlier, and tomorrow I'm going to do a talk about purpose because I think there's no point in talking about what you do in life or how you do it if you don't know why you're doing it. You know, purpose is yeah. around the capital. And so I was reading an article, a paper actually, and it was talking about this incredible drive in banking for personalization. And people think that personalization is the, 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 the end all for loyalty. It's the ultimate goal. Tomorrow, we even this morning, we saw it at the, the, you know, the audience was asked and they said, personalization will make the customer the most loyal. Now, here's a slightly deeper question for you, because in this article, the author argued that too much personalization is not good because people want to feel uh, important because of the reflection with others. And so in the old days, we had family or church or any other religion, or in a bad way, or even class, where you came from, it gave you a community that you belong to. Nowadays, It's all about me, it's about personalization, but it doesn't make us happier. So tell me, why do you feel that communities are so incredibly important to financial services and how can you create them? Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no. It's a difficult question, actually. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, I You're started right. to. Uh, no, you no, can do this. no, no, no. I, I, I already mentally was answering, but okay. I, I didn't tell my voice. So <laughs> give the voice to it, Matthias. <laughs> no. Um, so the, the I and I and you caught me on thinking about actually uh, this this personalization versus the impact thing, right? And I think that personalization at the end of the day, yes, finds its limitations because it also means work for the user and for the customer. And this is something I would say rough guess 90% is too much work to personalize actually whatever you offer me to be personalized so i'm quite happy to take the standard first of all it's easier um on the one side and yes of course uh also uh, i would say that the majority of consumers doesn't care too much about whatever the impact might be and and i would say for many many very fair reasons yeah i'm, I'm will not put that down for many fair reasons price is more or less the most important uh, component, um, and UX also, uh, easiness also. Um, however, um, I think it's absolutely needed, not only for marketing reason, to have a very good profile. But whenever you offer something, the profile must allow you to be different. Otherwise, you shouldn't do this. 
right? I, at least my opinion. Um, others are kind of mediocre, have no profile, and they compensate that with communication money. Fine. If you do not have that comp communication money, you need to be unique. Um, in marketing, we call this unique selling proposition. Um, now, that's not only the reason why I think about a, a, what is the impact of your business, right? And, and also uh, why a community in, in, in consumer business makes sense. In particular in banking, because even in um, highly uh, developed countries, I would say the degree of financial illiteracy is high. Yeah, it's high. You can be a super educated professor in, in, in medicine, whatsoever, dentist, whatever. In terms of money, you are totally unexperienced and you are, uh, by definition, a victim of your so-called advisor. Yeah. Okay? So this means, this means this is an endangered situation. Once we speak about actually um, uh, emerging markets, that's even more dramatical, of course, the picture. Not only that people are not banked, 50%, 60%, I would say 90% are totally illiterate when, it's come, when, when it comes to finance. If we want to have a stable society, at least this is one component to a stable society, of course, to many other very relevant ones, like health, like nutrition and so on, like, like uh, uh, also environment, and uh, exactly. If, it, if we want to have a stable society, we must, in particular in emerging markets, we must have the, the, the tools and the opportunities to educate people on money matters. Like it or not, by the yeah. way. Um, uh, we, I, I quite often come and run into this kind of prejudice, yeah, talking about money uh, isn't good and you shouldn't do this yeah. and this is not a good topic to speak about. Well, guys, I just can say if you never educate people, your kids, your family, whomever, on money matters, actually, don't, don't be surprised that they ran or will run into any kind of debt trap, that they will waste money on the wrong investments, that they will spend it into what we in the German yeah. environment call the great capital market, which year by year is sinking something like 30 to 40 billion euros Right, simply because of disinformation and greed, a combination out yeah. of the two, um, simply because people still believe that there is a bond which can pay you out 7% per month, you know, and all that stuff. And once you have a community, I find it to be at least an alternative offer of communication in which you then can raise your question and say, listen, I've been offered a participation right of 7% per month. Guys, do you think this is a decent offer? Yes yeah. or no? And if they pay me 7% per month, why don't they go to the bank, actually get a normal loan for 2% a year or 5% a yeah. year, whatever, instead of paying me 7 per month? Guys, hello, alarm bells going on. Should I do this? Yes or no? Save my money. Rescue me. You know, yeah. this is a very, let me say, hands-on example for why you need a community. Yeah. Because the advisor, the so-called sales force, who is paid commission, not, and the commission is not linked to your financial To my work, welfare. financial welfare. No. Exactly. It's, but it's linked to his financial welfare. Exactly. So <laughs> this or person, <laughs> this person never yeah. will give you an honest no. answer. Okay. Final one then, uh, Matthias. Um, do you see a similar knee drive when we look at Asia? Uh, because we, we're all focusing very much on Asia these days. I think I see a new Silk Road, you know, there is, yeah. uh, we, we, we tend to think that, you know, we are the, the masters of the universe, whereas really only the last 150 years we've been in control, it was always China. I mean, how do you look at this whole development? Extremely exciting. Uh, I find that to be extremely exciting because I think we're really witnessing, uh, as you say, a, a change in in this era. Actually, taking uh, having China being back as as one of the uh, world powers, in particular economically, in particular when it comes to money, uh, we we see that um, how this Silk Road concept is growing and moving into Europe uh, with. A lot of discussions, uh, consequently, uh, actually regarding that development. But if you if you look to the to the to Asia, excluding China, I find that to be extremely vibrant, fast growing. Uh, if I have my facts right, like uh, the the whole 
development there like uh, 25 to 30 years and and you will have double the size of population just imagine this this is on the one side fascinating if you see that growth of the market itself on the other side i would say it's really scary looking to our environmental problems we face today already just imagine this being doubled up and and if we are of whatever kind of health and might experience that at least our kids will um that's a bit scary but and i have got yeah. a question on uh, on that one all the um, eastern companies like gocheck etc they are embedding um, the finance into their platforms mm -hmm. right if you're talking about risks like hey is this a good loan or is this a good payment they don't even know because they're just buying something and it's totally yeah. matter so so the the risk of that, that do you that's see a that good too? point because i do really think that by internet of things and by uh, emerging e-commerce and all that stuff actually financial services will more and more disappear for you yeah, yeah you will not see that anymore yeah. actually you will only embedded. feel it yeah. exactly but you will only feel it once you see your negative account statement exactly. uh, or in future you will have the the voice bot actually telling your brian you overspent your salary so again you, again <laughs> and and for whatever reason that you know voice might remind us to our wives anyhow um so um so i i think financial illiteracy of course needs to be um uh, you need to teach people on that it, the topics will change Right, so you had an obvious account in the old days, and you did see the number. In future, you have a kind of uh, camouflaged account in your daily life, and you will be, in, in particular, more important. I find it to be actually, to, you need to be educated on this. That you, even that it's so smoothly moving around and then seamlessly floating your money away, and I think most of the concepts will pull your money instead of push money to you okay so it, it, even more it is important that you will be educated on this well matthias i'm afraid we've got to pull this to a close because you've so got a sad. lot to do yes so soon and and in fact you have to uh, run and prepare for your marvelous speech i mean i can't wait <laughs> to hear it i mean uh, matthias is going to talk about m a in fintech and uh, the short abbreviation for murder and assassination and i have to say i can't i can't wait to hear your story tomorrow so thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and i think you'll have to come back because we need to talk you know about the uh, the, the, the end to the the end of the resources of the planet and how we deal with it we have to talk about um challenger banks you know who are they challenging and why and are they really challenging anybody exactly. yeah. and we need to talk about why the germans always win with soccer right so that's a very important topic <laughs> no i think topic. we solved that problem we we? It. So i think we, we <laughs> after the last world championship in russia i think this is over you that's know? true <laughs> so, okay, okay. So. well i'm delighted uh, brian and i'm sure you join me in this and i'm i'm allowed to be politically incorrect here i'm delighted that we had this one fantastic single german here with a marvelous sense of humor i'll say it one more time <laughs> and now and now it's recorded for eternity yeah. thank you so much no, thank you very much have Matthias. a great week thank you connie thank you brian for having me it's 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 a pleasure it's a big honor being here thank you so much and thank you for listening to fintech cappuccino don't want to miss another cup subscribe to our podcast via spotify itunes or where you like to listen to your podcast and please give us a like a review so many more fantech cappuccino lovers can find us then yes and please join us again in two weeks saturday morning at nine we'll have a cup of coffee ready just the way you like it have a good have weekend a good